You're listening to the Gospel of Mark, a series preached by Pastor Dan Christians at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. You have your Bibles turned to Mark chapter 4. Uh, it really is one of the greatest pr- privileges of being able to preach the Word of God to sit down and study a text that you know well, only to discover that there is so much more than you ever imagined. That is certainly true with Mark. Chapter 4, it is the parable of the soils. It's found in Matthew chapter 13 as well. And it really is one of those passages that I think you can dive into and stay there for a long time. And The more you look, the more you find. It's just full. Really, any time Jesus opened his mouth, things he said were so full. They're so smart. right? They're so deep and so helpful. And so Mark, in his gospel, records the activities of Jesus at a very fast pace. Jesus is going from one thing to the next to the next. He's performing miracles and he's doing things. And Mark often mentions to us that he's teaching the people, but he rarely records that teaching for us. Most of the time, he's just telling us what Jesus is doing. And so this is one of those occasions where Mark even stops to say, here is what Jesus taught the people. And I think it's really important because Mark is explaining to us why the people were responding the way, that, the way that they were to Jesus, and why they would respond that, the way that they would respond in the future. Because what's fascinating here is that he makes the point over and over again already in the first four chapters that the crowds were growing, and they were growing, and his popularity was becoming greater and greater and greater, so much so that a lot of people think that his popular, popularity might have been at its highest at this point. Right? He's gathered around the Sea of Galilee. He's, he's on a boat, he's teaching, and there's thousands of people that have come from all over the empire to hear what Jesus has to say. And as we think about that, we might think, well, that kind of makes sense. Here you have a man who was going around, and he was performing miracles. He was healing people from their diseases. He was, he was doing incredible things. He was even casting out demons. He had control over the spiritual realm. But... As we think about it, we might miss kind of the the Jewish part of this. That as a Jew, it wasn't just that there's this guy doing these really cool things. It's not just that there's this man who's challenging the religious and political establishment, but that Jesus is actually potentially fulfilling a promise that they've been clinging to for thousands of years. The Jews were waiting for the Messiah to come. They were looking for the Messiah. And as the Roman uh, government taxed them more and more, and as they felt more and more oppressed by those over top of them, they longed for deliverance. And so I think people were coming partially because they thought, maybe, just maybe, this is him. This is the one that that was prophesied about. This is the one that will set us free. This will be our king. John MacArthur says that first century Israel was dominated by messianic expectation. As the weight of foreign oppression grew heavier, the flames of messianic expectation burned brighter. That's the case. And so these people, they're coming, and they're coming with an excitement. They're coming hoping that Jesus really is the one. And so we will look at the parable that Jesus speaks before this massive crowd. And we might be somewhat surprised what Jesus decides to say on this occasion. Why tell this parable? What what is he trying to get at? What's the lesson for those people? What's the lesson for the disciples? And ultimately, what's the lesson for us? And so what I've found as I've studied it, and I really wanted to go through Mark quickly. I really wanted to, to fit this all in one week. But what I found is there's way too much there. And so I think there's a great lesson to be found in the parable itself. And I think there's also a wonderful lesson to be learned in the surrounding verses of the parable. We learn a lot about the ministry of Christ, his strategy with the people. And and so next week, or I guess two weeks from now, we'll be looking more at the farmer and more at the strategy of Christ and a little bit at the really confusing verses in in verses 10 to 12. And this week, we're going to spend our time focusing on the parable itself and the lesson of the soils and what we can learn from the four different soils that Jesus gives. And so let's begin looking at Mark chapter 4, verse 1. 
And he began to teach again by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. So here is Jesus, the pragmatic carpenter's son, who sees this problem, who sees that here he is, and he's trying to teach the people, but the crowd is pushing in and pushing in and pushing in, so much so that there's people, I mean, they're, they're in the spit zone, right? And he's trying to convey this message to people far away that are there to hear him. And it's just not working. And so he looks around, and Jesus says, hey, there's a boat, there's a sea, why don't I just cast off, you know, 10 feet from the sea and, and let people gather around the sea? And so that's exactly what he did. And so here's Jesus just being smart. And here is all these people there, and you've got you to picture them just longing for Jesus to be the one. They can't wait to hear what he's going to say. They can't wait to see the miracles that he's going to do. Right? He is their deliverer. And so, Jesus decides to give them a parable. Verse number 2. He taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, or listen, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured them up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, because it had no root, and it withered away. And some fell among thorns, The thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and it did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty and some sixty and some a hundredfold. And he said unto them, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. This is Mark's record of one of the most well-known parables that Jesus told. And it is a story that, on face value, everybody would have understood what he was saying. I mean, everybody would have understood at least what the story meant, right? Here's a story told in an agricultural community about a farmer who goes out farming. And this farmer goes and he sows seed, and they would have recognized that, hey, they don't have big machines that can till perfectly straight lines and then plant the seed right where it needs to be. And so, instead, they're... they're digging up their soil, and then they're throwing seed. And there's some pass, and the seed's falling on the pass. And there's, there's some ground that has rocks underneath, and it's falling there. And then there's some good ground, it's falling there. And there's some ground where maybe they tried to pull out some of the weeds and cut off the tops, and it, it just didn't work perfectly. With them. Hey, I'm going to throw some seed there just in case. You know, the, the farmer just kind of almost recklessly scatters the seed everywhere in hopes that some seed will grow. And then at the end, he says... If you have ears to hear, let him hear. And what he's saying here is some will have ears to hear and some won't, but he's also saying let him hear. He wants them to understand. His desire is that they know what he's talking about. Then he leaves it at that. It's interesting because you've got to imagine these thousands of people that have come to hear Jesus speak, and, and some of them came thinking this is the Messiah, and then they heard the story, and I'm sure they walked away thinking, Messiah? What's that story about? What is he talking about? Soils and sowing? And what's this farming story got anything to do with him becoming the king of Israel who's going to lead us out of the oppression of the Romans? And others may have come. They may have come thinking, ah, hey, I heard that the carpenter's son is given a lesson. You know, and some other people are going, hey, why don't we just go and, and see what this is all about? And they hear these stories. They hear these parables. And they see. And they understand. And they go there thinking they're going to listen to an interesting carpenter's son. And they leave recognizing Jesus as the Messiah. And you wonder, what is it? Why? Why some and not others? What's going on here? Well, part of this is Jesus is giving this parable to explain to them what is going on here. Why is this? And so in verse 13... Jesus is now speaking with his inner circle. So the, the apostles are there, and then there's, there's other disciples present. But these are those who are close to Jesus, who follow him all the time, not just part of the 
crowd that have come to watch. Verse 13, and he said unto them, Know you not this parable? Don't you understand what I'm saying? Don't you get what I'm teaching here? Then he says, and how then will you know all the parables? In other words, if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand any of the parables. And that's an interesting statement because it's almost like this parable is the key to other parables. And when you understand this parable correctly, you understand how it is the key to all the parables. But when he says that, it just confuses you even further if you don't understand the parable, right? So it's an interesting statement. Of course, that statement makes perfect sense. And so he explains in verse 14 how that statement makes perfect sense. He says, the sower sows the word. The word of God. The sower, the farmer, is going out and and the seeds are, are being cast. It is the word of God being sown. And these are they which fell by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. And I, I think this part's really interesting, because here he explains that the, the seed is sown just like it is everywhere else. And it's there for a moment, just like it is everywhere else. But Satan comes immediately because that seed... See, Satan has no control over where the seed is sown. He has no control on the type of soil that, that receives it. But as soon as he sees that that seed is being left to dry, that it's not being touched, that it's, it's fallen on the, the hard path, the wayside, right? The place that everybody walks in, and the seed just can't penetrate the hardness of that ground. As soon as he sees that, he is quick to get rid of it. He goes as fast as he can, he takes it up, he snatches it away, and it's gone forever. And he says in verse 16, These are likewise which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Here's the second seed. And this time, it's sown on stony ground. Israel, around these parts, had some good farmland, but there's also some land that had just a little bit of soil, and below that soil you would find bedrock. And so there were places where it looked like you could grow something there. And so you'd cast seed. And what would happen is the sun would come out and would warm up the rock below, and and because of the warmth and and, and this shallow soil, you would have very quick germination. This seed would seem to grow immediately, and if you didn't know the difference, you'd look at both that and the good soil and say, hey, look, seed's growing, seed's growing, this is good. But he's clear here that as the sun stays up, and as the sun beats down on that seed, there is no root. So when the immediate soil is finished, when it's it's the, the nutrients are gone when the water there is diminished. There's no root to go elsewhere. There's, there's no strength to that plant, right? I've been talking uh, with Steve Peters, and he runs uh, uh, one of those big domes. What are they called? Greenhouse. He runs, and, and, and I mean, he's a grower, right? And, and so he does this, and he explains the different strategies that growers have to ensure that their roots go as, as far as possible. Right? And one of the things that we often do to a plant that's actually not good is we feed it too much all at the beginning, and we water it too much at the beginning, and we don't allow the root system to go out and find food. And so when there is a, a sparsity of food and, and less water, the root system's not in place. Well, that's exactly what's happened here. The root system is not in place. And so as soon as adversity comes because of the word, it's dead, it's gone, it's dried up. There's nothing below it. There's no foundation. They were there because things were good for a moment. They were there because the crowds were there. They were there because it was good and exciting, and they thought this was the answer. And as soon as it just doesn't seem as exciting and as awesome and all their wondrous uh, dreams aren't being fulfilled, they're gone. It goes on. Verse 18. These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, 
And the lust of other things entering in choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So in some places, and this is, this is really sad, because I know you've seen this. Word goes out. It's received. It's kind of becomes a part of that person's life. And Jesus is now this advisor that they have. And so they're following the words of Jesus to a point. But there are all these other things that are also growing. Right? There are all these thorns, all these weeds, all these other passions and desires and lusts that are growing alongside this seed. And if you've ever had a garden, you know that weeds grow faster than good plants, right? And so if you don't take care of the weeds, then the plant can never grow. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus is an advisor, but as soon as another advisor steps up and says, hey, I think you should do this and not that, and the person's flesh says, yeah, I want that, then Jesus is very quickly forgotten. He's never been king. He's never been put in the ultimate supreme position in this person's life. He's just added on. And this addition doesn't last. Because you will find very quickly there will be thousands of distractions. And not only thousands of distractions, there are. But there are very specific distractions that will, that will grab your flesh. Specifically the way you're designed. Your temptation. And if you're not careful, then it's going to choke out everything good. And here is what Jesus is explaining. The seed falls on this thorny ground, and it's there, and it starts to grow, and just everything else chokes it out. And finally, the good soil. right? The soil where it falls, and everything that's supposed to happen, happens. It goes into the soil, it germinates, it begins to grow, and eventually, it's not just a, a, a seedling. It's a plant. And it's a plant that's bearing fruit, some 30 and some 60 and some 100-fold. In other words, it's creating its own fruit that has its own seeds that will also fall and then start this process all over again. That is what's supposed to happen. One question that I've heard addressed um, by teachers when they're talking about this parable is, which of the soils represent believers in Christ? I would imagine that you are somewhat familiar with this, with the parable, and you probably have an idea of what you think. Uh, i got to be honest with you, I, I think I struggled with this early on, and I think probably when I was early 20s, I would have taught differently. But as I look at this parable today, I think that the answer is abundantly clear. I think there is one good soil. There is one soil that bears fruit. Really, in this parable, though you have four different kinds of soil, you could group them into two categories. You have the productive soil and the unproductive soil. And for whatever reason, all of these soils were unproductive. They were unfruitful. And the Bible is so abundantly clear that we're not saved by works. We're not saved by fruit. But that real faith, real salvation... With it comes fruit. Look at, uh, and you don't have to turn there, but I want to read a few verses for you. Just in John chapter 15, verse 6, Jesus says, If a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into a fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Disciples bear fruit. Disciples abide in Christ. If you abide in Christ, you will bear fruit. Real faith is enduring faith. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 10, Jesus said, And now also is the axe laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Matthew 12, 33, Jesus says, The tree is known by his fruit. In Romans chapter 6, verse 22, Paul said, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. 
I'm not trying to say that when you become a believer, it is just a straight progression upward. That you get saved, and then from that point on, you just take one step of holiness into another, into another, and every single time that you're confronted with sin, you, you, you react properly, that your temptations are no longer there. It's not like that, right? We recognize progressive sanctification, that everyday believers battle, and sometimes we lose, right? If you've never lost a battle, I want to talk to you after. We suck sometimes. We fail sometimes. It's a struggle. It's not easy. We still battle our flesh all the time. That's why there's so many reminders for us in Scripture that we need to obey the Spirit. We need to walk in the Spirit. We need to constantly go to the Word and go to God in prayer and say, God, I need your help. I can't do this by myself. I need you every single day to help me get over myself, die to myself so I can live for you. It's a difficult battle. But one thing also seems clear in Scripture. That true believers are in the battle. And if you're not in the battle, if you would say, yeah, I remember five years ago, six years ago, when I was a kid, I said this prayer. And from that point on, you, d- you wouldn't say that you've spent the rest of your life struggling against sin. right? Trying to follow the Spirit and not always doing it perfectly, but seeing that God has from one degree of glory to another, transforming you into the image of His Son. That is the direction of all true believers. We don't arrive there, this side of heaven, but we strive to get there, if that makes sense. That is what God is doing in our lives. And so, we should, you should, see fruit in your life. Coming to the Word of God, dishonestly, such a waste of time. And so if you want to get anything from this parable tonight and anything from what Jesus is saying here, you've got to be willing to assess your life. You've got to do more work beyond just listening to the words that I'm saying. It's not enough. That's actually part of what this parable is teaching, is that you can hear things and then they're gone. They're plucked away. They're, they're... So the real good tree is the one that hears the word, that gathers the nutrients, that takes in the water, and then does the work of applying it to themselves so that they'll grow. And that is absolutely essential. First John chapter 4, verse 19, John said, We love him because he first loved us. And do you notice that that is not a command? It's a statement of fact. So if we are good soil, if we are in Christ, if we've, if we've trusted Christ as our Savior, then that first part of the statement, we love him, is true. Because we understand that he first loved us. And if you don't fully comprehend the love of Christ for you, then you're not in him and you don't love him. And if you don't love him, but you say that you know he, how he loved you, I would... I would encourage you to revisit the cross. You need to go back there. You need to once again see his love. So, we picture this scene. Thousands of people around. Jesus is teaching. They are hoping and believing that this might be the Messiah. His popularity is off the charts and rising. If he so chose, he could become the king today. You could say, yeah, no, we're going we're gonna to take over the Roman government. I'm going to be your leader, and you're gonna, going to make me this, into this position as your Messiah. He had that power and that popularity at this point. But remember, it was Satan that promised him the kingdoms of the world without the cross. And Jesus knew that no matter what the people wanted and no matter what the people thought, He first had to come as a suffering servant before he could be the warrior king. They only wanted the warrior king. And so here Jesus is giving this parable because what this does is it really helps his disciples and it helps us understand how his popularity was so massive at this point and how it seemed to dwindle so rapidly when things turned bad. Here, he's... (laughs) like a rock star. And then in a couple years, 
He has maybe a few hundred followers, and all of these people and thousands more are shouting, crucify him. How does that happen? He didn't stop doing miracles. He didn't change his teaching. He didn't change his strategy or his method. Well, what happened is these people that were there because it was exciting, these people that were willing to add Jesus to their lives, the rocky ground, the thorny soil, those people, they either pushed out Jesus because they had too much else going on and the riches of the, and the cares of this life just didn't have room for Jesus, or they saw that, hey, following Jesus requires a cross, that there's adversity involved, and so they said, I don't, I don't want that Messiah. So instead of shouting, Jesus, be my king, they shouted, Jesus, be crucified. And so this parable has so much explanatory power. It's amazing. Many of the religious leaders would not accept a word he said. And this parable explains why, right? In Mark chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus is in the middle of healing a man's hand. An amazing miracle. Everybody should fall on their face and worship a guy who can just do what Jesus did here. And when he looked around about them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. Verse 6. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Do you remember how crazy this is? That he's healing a man. And their response is to want to destroy him. What is going on with these religious leaders? Maybe they're hard soil. Maybe they have absolutely no room for the word of God in their life. And it has been taken away by Satan immediately. Mark chapter 3 verse 22 again. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem, said, He has Beelzebub, and by the prince of devils casts he out devils. And maybe their response is just to say, no, he's, he's satanic. We don't need to listen to what he says because he is, he is doing this in the power of Satan. Crazy. It doesn't make any sense. Those are the excuses that we come up with to reject the word of God. But they weren't all hard soil. There were some that believed to a point, but they were held back by the cost. We actually see this often in Jesus' ministry. There are many that come to hear Jesus, and as soon as his teaching gets difficult, they leave him. In John 6, verse 66, it says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. From what time? What happened here? Did Jesus, like, stop doing miracles? Did he decide he was unkind? Did, like, what, what? Oh, he just taught a difficult message? Really? Like, you didn't like a little bit of what the king had to say, and so he decided, nah, not him. It doesn't make any sense. John chapter 12, verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. Now, recognize that there are times that Jesus said people believed on him, and, and what he means is they believed him to a point. They, they believed some of what he was saying. They were starting to track with him, but listen to what it says. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. They love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Yeah, Jesus, no, it's going to cost us something. Never mind. I'm good. And we're like that too. I mean, not all of us, but but sometimes, right? And there are certainly many people. That's This is the massive danger of the prosperity gospel because it, it tells people that they should be rocky soil, right? Like, hey, you should believe in Jesus because he'll make all of your dreams come true. That's exactly what the rocky soil wants to happen. And as soon as adversity comes, what happens? They're gone. There's no faith. It's creating all of these false disciples. And so some believe to a point. Maybe they were drawn in by the enthusiasm of others. Maybe they were emotional. Uh, Alistair Begg was talking this. I heard him give a message uh, this past week. And one of the things he mentioned that really struck me was that it's easy to create an emotional response in people. That's awesome to hear you say, because uh, I don't know if I could do it. I think that there are many people that are gifted to do it. But what he was getting at was, that's not our job. Like, I'm so happy that that's not my job. I don't want to tell a story and get you to cry and come to an altar. I want you to be, I want to give you what the Word of God says and let that germinate in your heart and and grow fruit. And I want it to be lasting. And so, for some, it's easy to create an emotional response. That's not what it's about. It's not that it's not emotional at all. It's not divorced from your emotions. But it's also 
it's a decision of your will, of your intellect, to, to follow Christ because he is the king. He is the savior. He's the only way. And then after that, sure, get emotional. Let your emotions follow your will, not, not your will follow your emotions. And so there are some who are emotional. But they're not prepared to bear a cross. They want to be disciples, but they don't want to be the cost necessary to be a disciple. And so, tonight, are you willing to bear your cross, if that's what it means to be a disciple of Christ? You have others who are there, and they listen and they seem to believe. In all appearances, they've added Jesus to their life. But this was more of mental assent to the truths that Jesus was teaching. Oh, yeah, okay, I agree with that. Yeah, sure, that's good. I I think that he's right there. Okay, I can can track with that. And They're adding Jesus to their lives, but he's not their king. He simply joins that board of advisors we talked about. As soon as their flesh desires something that Jesus does not, they find another advisor. And... Thorns grow, the weeds grow, and it chokes out everything good that was happening. Soon there is a plant, barely, and no fruit. No fruit. I think of Demas in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Paul is writing to the church of Colossae, and he's saying, Hey, Luke, the beloved physician, Luke, the writer of the book of Luke and Acts, I mean, this is a great guy who was such an amazing disciple of Christ. He says, And Demas, greet you. He's he's, he's putting these two guys together, and that means Demas is this disciple who is a follower of Jesus and, you know, helping Paul. And I just want you to know that these two guys greet you. It seems everything's good. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. What a sad thing. A few years after Paul writes the book of Colossians, he writes another letter to Timothy and says, hey, listen, I hate to say this, but Demas is gone. He loved the world too much. He loved the things of the world. He loves the pleasure. He, he, he lusted and he could not, did not, would not control his flesh. And then there were those who believed and produced fruit. Enduring fruit. There were those who came and heard the carpenter and recognized the Messiah and understood that his his way to king was first to be the priest and the prophet. Jesus Christ, prophet, priest, and king. They wanted a king and they didn't want a prophet and, and they recognized that Jesus had to offer the sacrifice of the priest and bring the word of God from the prophet before he was the king to come and, and save them. I hope that through these examples, you have begun to think about how you fit into this parable. Uh, There was actually a few questions that I thought about early on that were kind of haunting me. And the first question was, do I have the right to demand the soil become another soil? Do I have the right to do that? Is that that a, a proper application of the text to say, well, if you're this soil, you should be more like this? And the second question was, is it possible for believers to also struggle with a lack of hearing entirely, with adversity in their lives, and with distractions? Is it possible for believers to learn something from this? I think it's abundantly clear that a great deal of this message is to instruct the farmer. It's to instruct the sower of the seeds to encourage them in their task, to keep them moving on. And so we are going to talk a lot more about that this next week. But here's the thing that that struck me as interesting. Jesus gave the parable to all these people, and then when he looked at his followers, he said, wait, don't you guys get it as well? Like, you don't understand this parable? You You really don't understand parables? Hey, let me help you. Let me get you to the place where you do understand. I, don't, I certainly don't have the power to, to change you from being one soil to another, but I think it is instructive here that Jesus takes the parable and he opens it up again and says, I want you to see this. 
I want you to, to not just hear it physically, but I want you to appropriate it to your life. I want you to, to change because of what's being said. I want you to get it, not just hear it. And so because he does that, I kind of feel like I can say that too. If you're here tonight, I want you to get it. I don't want you to be the kind of soil to, to, to hear and then let it go. I want you to think about it. What is this talking about? There are, are two conclusions here. There are those who hear the word of God and ultimately do nothing with it. Maybe something for a little time, but there's no fruit, there's nothing lasting, and every, nothing good comes of it in the end. And then there are those who hear the word of God and they're good soil and the soil grows and they bring forth fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. I mean, there are the two options. So I think you need to go, where do I sit? Where do I stand? Which soil am I? Am I coming to the word of God with the desire to really know what it says? Am I asking God to help me? I, I really think that's a, that's a great prayer that you should pray often. God, help me understand what your word is saying here. Really, if you're a believer, you put the spirit inside of you so you, you would understand it. And if you're not a believer, he's convicting you through his word of sin and righteousness and judgment. And so I think it's good to step back and say, God, I want to know what you have to say. So I, I think it is appropriate to say, hey, what soil are you? Try to be good soil. Let's do our best to hear the word of God and apply it to our lives. When I was studying for this, uh, about a week ago, I thought, you know what, I'm going to talk to the boys a little bit about, my boys, about what uh, this parable. And so I sat down and I told them the parable, and, and then at the end of the parable I said, and we talked about it for quite a while, I said, hey, what, what type of soil do you think you are? And I, I love their honesty, not always their answer. Right? And so it, some of them said, I think I'm I'm sometimes thorny, right? That I hear what's being said, and I know what I'm supposed to do, but I have all the other things that I want to do. Uh, We went on vacation. We had a great time as a family. But the very last day on our way back, it was very clear that everybody either didn't have enough sleep or was just, they were struggling with their flesh, right? And I'm including myself in in the group. We were all struggling a little bit. And so we decided to have like a little powwow in our hotel room and we talked about how we were all not treating each other with love and kindness and all these things. And, and then Landon said, I think it's because we've been having so much fun that we forgot to love the gospel. I was like, what? <laughs> I, yeah, you should be doing my job. That's right. So he hit it right in the head, right? And so I asked the boys, and they say, yeah, sometimes you know, I, I want to do the right thing, but there's other things I want to do too, and, and, and I, I struggle with that. And, and sometimes they're like, yeah, sometimes I get really excited about these things, but then I, I, don't, want, I don't want it to be difficult in my life. And, and I think one of them said, yeah, sometimes I feel like I just listen and then I don't really care. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and then they said, hey, Daddy, what soil are you? Well... And so I tried to, you know, I, I'm good soil. But I, then I thought about that. I thought, you know what? Yeah, I know, I'm, I, know I, I know the gospel, and I love the gospel, and I love Christ, and, and so I know I'm ultimately good soil. But I also know that these things that, that are cropping up in other people, I still have a flesh, and they still crop up in my life too. And there are still things that I, that I love, and sometimes I love them too much, right? They distract me. There are also things, times when... I know I should do something that's going to cost me something. I don't want to sacrifice, right? And so, so even these fleshly responses of people are sometimes present in the believer's life. And it was helpful for me, looking at this parable, to say, okay, where do I need to try to stop being thorny and stop being rocky and start being more of the good soil? And so I hope that you'll see and, and you'll see in a couple of weeks that this, really, there's so much to learn about being a farmer, being a sower, being an evangelist in this parable. There's so much to learn, to learn about ministry strategy and how Jesus gives it, and even those confusing verses in the middle. But tonight I want to look at the soils and ask yourself the question, 
where am I at, and where should I be? 